This webinar is basically, uh, again, the truth about inflammation. Uh, basically, it's going to be talking a bunch of different facts about inflammation and how inflammation can have an impact on your system. So uh, the first thing that I always talk about on these is a little bit about myself, uh, just basically to kind of give you an idea of like as to why I'm actually bothering to talk about this. Um, my background is basically, uh, again, I'm a chiropractor. Um, I have, um, you know, a lot of different training, a lot of different certifications. Um, so there's a lot of different stuff that's going on there. But part of what we have is we do have a lot of education when it comes to nutrition and supplements. Um, basically, when I talk to people about trying to get people better, I look at things from the standpoint that there are, it's like a four legged stool to try to get somebody better. And the first part is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, is joint health, making sure that the joints move right and all that other kind of stuff. That's kind of like what a chiropractor does, um, like the essence of it. We also look at things from the standpoint of making sure that muscles are balanced the way that they should be. So you end up getting a, the situation where you don't want muscles to be too tight. You don't want muscles to be too weak. So there needs to be a balance between th those. So a muscle that's too tight needs to get loosened up. A muscle that's too weak needs rehab it needs exercise it needs to get stronger and then those are the first three and then the last one that i always talk about is nutrition and inflammation that is one of the components to getting somebody better you know again if somebody's had damage and injury you know you need protein in order to help rebuild muscle and other kinds of things like that but the level of inflammation that you have in your system is one of the things that has the tendency to basically uh help determine how bad that things are or how severe that pain might be. Um, so that's one of the things that's there. So we're going to talk about, like I said, what inflammation is and how we can kind of like uh, go about trying to help fix some of that. So what is inflammation? Uh, inflammation is basically a biological response that's triggered by the immune system. Basically, if you have something in the body or something that the body is exposed to, where you have an irritant or a pathogen or something that's damaging the cell, the immune system is going to uh, basically release different kind of inflammatory chemicals so that you start the inflammatory response. So if you talk about infections, wounds, damage to any tissue, anything like that, you need the inflammatory response in order to heal. So inflammation is a normal kind of a thing that you're supposed to have. There is a difference, though, between what we have when it comes to acute inflammation and this other thing called chronic inflammation. The, this is mostly about chronic inflammation because of the, the way that stuff works. So again, this is a, a picture here of um, all the different things that might cause acute inflammation. And again, acute inflammation is something that you need in the system in order for your body to start the healing process. You know, you basically, you know, if there's, you know, stuff that's damaged and, you know, debris that you need to get, get rid of, you know, you basically break things down. And that's one of the things, you know, like, you know, as gross as what it might sound, but pus is there for a reason, because um, it's helping to break things down and get things uh, cleaned up. Right. So there's a bunch of different stuff that happens with that. All those different things are related to acute inflammation. So another picture that you have here, and let me get my little pointer out here so we can, you know, do something fancy. So when we talk about something like this, if you have a pin or if you have something, and again, especially if it hasn't been sterilized or any of that other kind of stuff, or if the pin itself isn't sterile, when you end up introducing that into the person's tissue, again, you're going to have bacteria and other kinds of chemicals that are going to be on that uh, foreign body, right? And when that happens, you're also going to end up getting damage to the tissue. And what happens is, is that like, if you, you know, like not trying to bore anybody, but if you remember the contents of the cell, right? So you have like the mitochondria, the Golgi body, the endoplasmic reticulum, all those other kind of things. When those kind of things that when the inside contents of the cell get spilled, that's some of the chemical signals that the body uses. So you have these chemical signals that go out, they're going to start attracting phagocytes. So you're going to have these different cells that are going to move into the area in order to break up the area. And again, you can have swelling in the area, you can end up having redness, 
you know, uh, heat, all that other kind of stuff can be related to that. That's the whole process of acute inflammation. So if you can think of like any time that you might have gotten a cut or anything and you started to get that infection, that's the process that you get with acute inflammation, right? All that stuff is normal. Okay. And that is the good news, right? There's good news and bad news when it comes to this inflammation stuff. Again, the good news is that inflammation is going to be basically the body's first line of defense against harm. It's how you help to protect yourself. It's how you protect yourself against foreign invaders and all that other kind of stuff. It's how you self-protect. It's how you start the healing process. That's called acute inflammation. The bad news is, is that there's this process that is also kind of associated with it, which is a long-term process, which is also known as chronic inflammation, right? Long-term inflammation that lasts for prolonged periods of time, again, several months to years, that's going to end up being chronic inflammation. And the bad, bad news about all that is that chronic inflammation can eventually be one of the, if not the actual cause, one of the things that contributes to a multitude of diseases and conditions. Again, this can include cancers. This can in include like rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune diseases, different stuff like that. So let's take a look a little bit at some of the different stuff more about chronic inflammation. So causes of chronic inflammation, you can have a number of different things that do it. But when you talk about if the body basically fails to eliminate the cause of an acute inflammatory problem, so you get an infection or a fungus or you have some other kind of parasite and the harmful uh, thing, whatever the pathogen basically sticks around, that can be one of the things that kind of ramps up chronic inflammation. If you have an exposure to a low level of a of an irritant or a toxin or foreign material, something like that, um, again, pollution, those kind of things. Um, those are things if they can't be eliminated, um, you know, people that have exposure to um, pollution, that is a major um, increase in the amount of chronic inflammation that a person can have. Um, if a person has an autoimmune disorder, and again, the immune system is attacking healthy tissue, there's going to be a little bit more chronic inflammation there. And if you end up having a uh, biochemical like uh, you know, signals that basically lead to extra oxidative stress if you have problems with the mitochondria, uh, other kind of stuff like that. So biochemical inducers, when we talk about those things, those would be like the foods and things that are in your system, right? So that that is, there's other things, but the main way that we look at that is like the foods that you eat. So one of the examples when you talk about the body failing to eliminate the cause of acute inflammation would be this thing called leaky gut syndrome. If you look over here in a person's gut, you end up having cells that kind of protect the outside of it. You end up having blood that's in through. And this is obviously like a very um, simple version of what's going on. But you end up having this these tight junctions that are in between the cells. And there's a misspelling there. So sorry about that. But there is these tight junctions that's in between the cells. And the cells are basically lined up really, really close next to each other. When they're lined up close next to each other, it prevents things from getting through in between the cells. It's called the paracellular mechanism of going through. What's supposed to happen is, is that you've got mucus, you've got all these villi that are sticking up that basically help to absorb things. And you're trying to take things that your body wants, like, you know, basically like sugar and other kinds of things like that and transport it through the cell and into the uh and into the the rest of the system if you end up having inflammation this is one of the things that can an inflammation of the gut can lead to more inflammation of the entire system so when you end up having these um uh, tight junctions when they start getting broken up and then you get separation between the, cer the cells, you end up getting things that are coming not necessarily uh, through the cells, but you end up going around the cells. And you get large uh, either bacteria that goes through. Again, this shows something like gluten or other kinds of proteins that get through. And when something is large enough and it goes in the system, your body reacts to these because they're not supposed to be there. So this is just another one of those examples of what happens when people end up getting um, you know, this is leaky gut syndrome in and of itself. It is a cause of chronic inflammation, but it's also a result of chronic inflammation. So the two of them basically work with each other, right? Um, so when it comes down to it, there's a whole host of different things that 
it, it, it relates to when it comes to this. Now, I'm not going to sit there and say that everything in this little picture of this person that looks like they're stressed out, I'm not saying that everything that's on here is going to be something that is directly being caused by chronic inflammation, but most of the things that are on here are, you know, basically everything on here is a chronic disease. And every chronic disease pretty much gets made worse by certain things like, you know, smoking is one thing, but if you have more inflammation, then you end up having more of a problem that's there. And basically the World Health Organization ranks chronic disease as the greatest threat to human health. Again, these are things that, um, you know, that, that, that affect people, you know, cause damage, you know, millions of dollars worth of stuff. Um, you know, every year. So again, chronic inflammatory diseases are a significant cause of death in the world. And, you know, again, not everything is a direct cause, but it is something that can be affected. So to, to talk about one of the things when it comes to chronic inflammation, let's talk a little bit about the foods. So there are certain foods that have the tendency to promote inflammation, right? You know, again, you read this kind of thing, and this is taking things like to a um you know again to the extreme i'm not gonna say that there is you know that everybody is going to go through and decide that they're going to get rid of all of these things but the idea is is that you know because nobody's ever going to get completely get rid of sugar right you're probably not going to get rid of all grains but the idea is is that when it comes down to it if you can eat less of these inflammatory foods that is going to be something that is going to be good for your health right so eating less sugar eating less grains in general um any animal that eats grains. Again, this is one of those kind of things that to me is interesting from the idea that, you know, again, most people, they talk about, you know, like there's USDA grain fed, you know, like beef and all that other kind of stuff. Again, if it's grass fed, it has the tendency to be more healthy. If you talk about, um, most people know that red meat is typically not as good for you as uh, something like chicken or something like that. But if you compare grass-fed beef to grain-fed chicken, the grass-fed beef is actually better for you from an inflammatory standpoint, right? So it's just interesting the way that some of these th kind of things go. Legumes, again, those are going to be a decent number of beans and stuff like that. They're not necessarily the best for inflammation. Trans fats are something that, you know, again, in present in margarine, processed foods, you know, so the, those are all like typically not great. Um, seed oil is not something that's not necessarily great so canola oil is not um, the main thing that you should be cooking your foods in and stuff like that anything that comes in a package you know things like potato chip and delayed onset food allergies is a totally different topic that we can get into that can last a little while but those are the different things that are there now when we talk about this again the more of a problem that somebody has that's related to inflammation the more likely or the more strict that somebody would need to be when it comes to avoiding these foods, right? If you don't really have many issues, then it isn't necessarily something that you need to like go, you know, nuts and completely move everything out of there. But if you end up having a ton of issues, if, you know, if there's multiple different chronic diseases that, that you have or that run in your family or other kinds of stuff like that, these are all things that have an impact, uh, you know, and this is all things that everything that's on here has the tendency. I'm not going to sit there and say that it will age everybody, but like, you know, like really, 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 but I think that it will have an effect, you know, somebody who is eating, you know, things that are not on this list, like fresh fruits and vegetables, and they don't really have a lot of fast food and they don't have, um, you know, those kind of things, those would be one of the factors that somebody would have that, you know, like you, everybody has seen somebody that you look at them and you're like, wow, you don't look your age, whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing, right? Somebody who is 50, who looks 65, or somebody who's 50, who you're like, wow, they could pass for 30. That's crazy, right? A lot of that stuff, you know, and again, not everything, but a lot of that stuff will relate to the amount of inflammation that you have in your system over years and years and years, right? So it's just something to kind of think of. So let's talk about some of the symptoms that you have when it comes to chronic inflammation. So some of the things that would be like a sign or a symbol that somebody might have chronic inflammation um, would be basically something along the lines of if you have uh, body pain, 
right? Like general aches and pains or pain all over, or if you have constant fatigue and insomnia, um, if there is, you know, if you suffer from depression, anxiety, mood disorders, that kind of stuff. And again, not saying that every single thing is going to be directly caused by this, but this is one of the, some of the things that are related to chronic inflammation. If you have gastrointestinal complications, like if you have constipation, diarrhea, acid reflux on a regular basis. If you um, if you have weight gain or if you're overweight or if you're obese, all of those things are symptoms that you end up having um, that, that are related to uh, chronic inflammation. And again, frequent infections. If you're always getting sick, then, you know, uh, I, I had a patient today that's talking about how they're going to be getting all these different tests. And I talked about, you know, this is one of the things to, to look at I mean, Like if you're always getting sick, then it could be things that, you know, some of the things that you eat, right. You know, if you look older than you are, that could be something that's related to it. You know, um, you know, if exercise seems like it's really stressful for you, those are all issues that kind of come down to um, whether or not chronic inflammation is playing a role, right? So again, this is another thing that's there. You, you end up having multiple different diseases that have been attributed or linked with chronic inflammation. So you talk about, you know, the things that you have listed and I'll just kind of list off some stuff. So asthma, cancers, heart disease, you know, the inflammation that you have inside of the blood vessels in the, you know, in your heart and in the rest of the system, you know, the atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis, like those are all things that are going to be related to chronic inflammation over long periods of time. Neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, obesity, periodontitis, rheumatoid arthritis, sinusitis, type two diabetes, and then you end up having ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. All of those are things that are gonna be related to chronic inflammation. And again, they all play a role. Not everything is a direct one-to-one -one correlation, but everything that's on there um, that's listed is gonna be something that you know is made worse by it at the very least, okay? Um, so there's a lot of different stuff. Now, there's obviously there's risk factors just like everything else. And these are risk factors that I've got listed here that are basically stuff that is, you know, specific to heart disease, but that kind of applies to like most of the rest of the stuff. So if you talk about people who smoke, if you talk about like having lots of different infections, like uh, overuse of alcohol, um, you know, people can have issues with genetics, uh, uh, unhealthy foods, obesity, having a sedentary lifestyle, people that have older age, like uh, age issues, as that goes up, that ends up being there and then stress. So again, your diet plays a role. Um, sometimes, uh, again, the amount of sleep and the amount of stress that you have are going to be roles that are in there. And when it comes down to it, you end up having, uh, you know, even there's something with, that has to do with uh, hormones, right? So low sex hormones and that kind of stuff, that can all have a role. Now, the thing that's interesting about most of this is that, and most people don't realize it, is that most of the factors that are there have one thing in common. And the one thing in common that they have is, is that, you know, like age, really, you don't necessarily have it, but everything else is, for the most part, kind of controllable through lifestyle changes, right? Again, stress and sleep disorders, sex hormones is actually something that you can change with lifestyle issues. Um, all of that stuff is things that, that you can change by working with the lifestyle stuff. So um, again, basically what we'll, what we'll do though now is that we'll just kind of talk about ways obviously to help prevent chronic inflammation. So the next step is basically if you look at this is going to be quitting smoking. Obviously, smoking is a huge issue, right? Um, smoking is a significant factor when it comes to inflammation. It's a huge issue when it comes to lifestyle. Um, it is one of the things that it is completely controllable. Um, it is obviously there's cravings and people have a lot of different stuff. But um, again, cigarette smoking is associated with lowering the production of anti-inflammatory molecules and it induces inflammation directly. Um, it also causes a bunch of different issues. But basically every single disease that we know of 
is pretty much made worse by smoking. So people that smoke, ideally, that's something that you need to try to get rid of. There are medications that you can use, like I believe Chantix is one of them. Um, obviously, some people can take it and some people can't. Um, there's usually something with smoking is that you have to, you know, the addiction is one thing and then replacing like the habit that you have with your hand and with the mouth and all that other kind of stuff that that's something that needs to be fixed. So usually you need to try to find something to replace it, which is one of the reasons why people do gum and, and other kinds of stuff. But there's a whole different load of things that are there. Acupuncture is also supposed to be really, really good at this. I don't do acupuncture personally, but um, I have heard that acupuncture is really, really good at helping people get over the initial part of quitting smoking. It's just making sure that you stay away from it. Okay. So that's that. The second part, or like the next thing to talk about is basically different parts of diet, right? So you have anti-inflammatory diet, right? And that is one of the best ways to do it. Um, basically, uh, you know, you can talk about food as being medicine, right? It can cause certain issues if you're eating the wrong stuff, but if you're eating the right stuff, you can be really good medicine that's there. So there's a whole bunch of different stuff that's there um, that, that's, uh, that, there are things that you can find, obviously, that you got to just load up your refrigerator the right way, right? The thing to realize, though, is that there's multiple different types of diets, you know, and there's, you know, multiple different ways to accomplish goals. And the anti-inflammatory diet or eating foods that are anti-inflammatory is going to be one of the components to that, okay? So there's some stuff that's going to be uh, maybe a little bit better than others, but um, you know, and everybody, it, it definitely depends on how you want to do it. But again, anti-inflammatory foods are going to be high in natural antioxidants, polyphenols. Again, these are going to be protective kind of compounds that we have within the cell. So let's take a look at some of the anti-inflammatory foods. Okay. So anti-inflammatory foods, um, again, fruits are going to be one of the major things. Obviously, you got to be careful with the amount of sugar that you got. But um, again, if you're eating the skin, you would want to make sure that it's organic. If you're not eating the skin, then organic doesn't matter nearly as much. Um, again, vegetables are typically eating most of that, so organic if you can. Um, nuts in moderation, just because they have a high amount of fat typically. And then you end up having cold water fish, right? So Alaskan salmon is going to be typically uh, something that's not farmed. If you ever talk about Atlantic salmon, then that is typically going to be farmed salmon where they often feed them grains. So wild or more specifically wild caught. Sometimes if you see wild, it means that they have caught a fish in the wild and then raised up the eggs in captivity. And then they call it wild, which is um, not kind of like defeating the purpose. But um, I can tell you that when uh, the Andersons was over in uh, Sylvania and they had that second store. Um, I know that I would go in there and they would have like the wild salmon next to the Atlantic salmon. And you could literally see the amount of difference in the fat that was contained in one versus the other. There was way more fat in the ones that were grain fed than the ones that were wild caught. And it's kind of crazy how it works. Again, grass-fed animal products. Again, potatoes, white potatoes can be, again, in moderation. You don't need to, you know, load up on the potatoes. But eggs can be as long as somebody's not allergic to them, but herbs and spices. So garlic, ginger, turmeric, you know, which is found in curry. Again, you have olive oil. Uh, butter is actually really, really good for you. Most people, uh, or at least I should say a lot of people think of butter as being a saturated fat and being problematic, but it's actually not. It's actually a very good fat for you to have. Again, you know, it, this is one of those kind of things that when it comes to foods, people have this uh, issue with it because things have changed over the years. You know, there was a time when everybody said that, oh, well, all the heart attack problems and everything was caused because of the way that people used to cook in the 50s and the 60s. So then we started changing the way that things were made and then you use way less butter. And when you use less fat and less butter, people had to make up for the taste in some way. So they added sugar. And that was with the low fat kind of stuff came the high carb. And then that was some of the, the areas where we ended up seeing major explosions and issues with heart disease and other kinds of things. So there's a, a load of different things that's there. Coconut oil is a really, really, really good oil. I'm personally not a fan of coconut flavor myself, but coconut oil, 
I love, right? Just because of the fact you can get ones that are like pressed a second time, but coconut oil is one of those weird things that if it's a little bit cool, then it's a solid, but if it warms up a little bit, it actually uh, melts. Um, it is a, um, basically it is a saturated fat and that kind of stuff. And yeah, the medium chain triglycerides, that kind of stuff, those are things that are related to coconut oil, but it's like fractions of the coconut oil. Like if you're, you're looking at somebody that ha is doing like MCTs type of stuff. So it can be good and the MCT stuff is good at trying to get people, um, to get ketones and other kinds of stuff when when they end up having that right but um but coconut oil is like the whole thing so again there's times that you can use mct when somebody's looking at that and that's uh that's the question there so um again water is great green tea um dark chocolate needs to be at least 60 percent uh uh cocoa or keiko or whatever um and then red wine and stout beer, you know, like that really fits my stuff with the dark chocolate, red wine and stout beer. Obviously, there's moderation when it comes to each of those diff different things. And then some of these things, some people can react to. So people can react to the yeast in beer or um, different stuff like that. So obviously, you have to be careful or whether or not it's gluten or any of that other kind of stuff. But notice there's no like grains that are on that specific list. You know, rice isn't typically too bad. But, you know, the main ones, when you talk about like wheat, barley, and rye, those have the tendency to promote inflammation, right? Oh, you know, oatmeal isn't typically too bad either. Uh, when it comes to the Mediterranean diet, um, again, the Mediterranean diet is one of those kind of things that is literally like, it, there are so many different studies on the Mediterranean diet to show that it has the ability to um, decrease issues and heart health and stuff like that even though you're adding decent amount of fats you're adding a bunch of different stuff to it that people don't necessarily eat here right so you talk about around the mediterranean the foods that they eat and different stuff like that uh the mediterranean diet is a, a fantastic thing that is like i said well studied so again um, it's associated with weight loss. It's associated with reduced risk of heart attack, strokes, type two diabetes, and premature death. Um, you know, so you can end up having. So let me just kind of give you like an example of some uh, some things. And again, you can get like look this up online as to what specifically is in the Mediterranean diet. But like on let's say on day one, you end up having breakfast, and that might have Greek yogurt with it, and then you can have strawberries and oats. Right. For lunch, you can have, you know, again, if you're eating grain, you can eat a whole grain sandwich with vegetables. So, again, when we talk about anti inflammatory, anti inflammatory says back off on the grains. Mediterranean diet says that grains are okay. Um, so, there's a different ways of going about it. But if you have a whole grain sandwich for lunch that second day, you have vegetables with it, that could be a good thing. And then dinner could be tuna salad. And again, you can have olive oil and then you can have a piece of fruit for dessert. On maybe day two, you have oatmeal with raisins. And then you have leftover tuna salad from the night before. And then you can have a salad with tomatoes, olive oil, fetid cheese, maybe a little bit of chicken, that kind of stuff. Right. So, there's a whole bunch of different stuff that's there. So, again, these inflammatory like causing foods and again you got a lot of different stuff that's there that's bread related but um again it's the foods that you eat and the foods that you don't eat so again you want to try to avoid or limit you know refined carbohydrates so again you end up having white bread and pastries and stuff like that um those are things that you want to be careful um again french fries and other fried foods um if it's fried it's not great if it's you know has a upc symbol on the box you know if it has a box then it's not good you know you talk about the foods that you want to buy is that you want to try to stay around the outside edge when you go into the grocery store for the most part you know be careful obviously around the ice cream and that kind of stuff but when you talk about like going through you know like the meat section going through like the fruits and vegetable section that kind of stuff you have to you know be careful with it again soda and other types of sugar sweetened beverages those are things that you need to be careful of. Um, you do, you know, just be careful about red meat. So, you know, burgers and steaks on a regular basis, especially if they're not grass fed. Um, and then processed meats, again, hot dog, sausage, you know, like uh, lunch meats, those kind of things. And then margarine, shortening, lard, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, again, butter is not a bad thing, but some of the other ones you got to be careful of. Okay. 
So those are things that are going to be related to inflammation. Another way that you can look at stuff is you can look at things from the standpoint of a low glycemic index. So low glycemic index is going to end up being the way that your body reacts to um, a food, right? So basically something that is, if you give a person straight glucose, that is as high glycemic as you can get. That's going to be a response of like, a hundred, right? So there's three different ratings for it. Low is going to be, you know, it depends on who you talk to, but maybe 55 or less. Medium is 56 to 60, or like 69. And then 70 or more would be a high glycemic index. Um, if you have a food like glucose, glucose is going to be at 100. You can't get much more than that. Um, when you end up having like white cereals and stuff like that, like, you know, white, um, white, you know, like, like white flour, that is going to be something that's going to be pretty much at like 99 or 100 as well. So the idea is to try to eat the foods that are in the low glycemic index um, count. So again, uh, foods that are when you follow a low glycemic index diet, um, again, that has studies that show that it results in weight loss, reduced blood sugar levels, and lower levels of heart disease and type 2 diabetes. And again, if you go back into that, you know, issue of like all of the different stuff, it's about trying to cut out the stuff that is in that bad list, you know, processed foods, those kind of things. Um, the fast foods, the, that those, that that's basically what you want to look at. And anytime that you talk about these diets, you know, we look at the foods and the foods that are available are like pretty easy for the most part. But when it comes down to it, like the idea is, is that you want to try to eat more of the foods that are good for you. Don't necessarily try to focus on the idea of what you're having less of, because then that's going to make it harder to actually go through and follow through with the with the diet itself. Right. Um, so there's multiple different things that you can have for the types of foods that are there. Um, so, again, you know, when it comes to inflammation, grains are not necessarily great for you. But when you talk about whole grains, whole grains actually are lower with the glycemic index. So if you had bread that was made that's 100% whole wheat, that's what you want to have, right? You don't want to have, you know, again, you need to realize that when it comes to breads and stuff like that, if it says that it's wheat bread, then typically wheat bread is something that has 51%, 100% whole wheat flour in it. And then it has 49% white flour, right? So unless it says 100% whole wheat, then it's probably going to end up being about 50% of it ends up being white flour. So that's the thing that you need to be aware of when it comes to that. So like the, the breads that, you know, that are just regular wheat, you know, that, that don't say 100%, those can be problematic, right? There's multiple different types of uh, cereals that are available, but, you know, the one that, you know, that is pretty much going to be good for you is going to be oatmeal as long as it's not instant oatmeal because instant oatmeal ends up having sections removed from it so that it can absorb the water a little bit faster um, you have multiple different types of fruits that are available right and again there's uh apples apricots blackberries blueberries cherries cranberries again ideally you want to get those kind of things when they're not dried um, but grapefruit, peaches, pears, prunes, again, if it's coming out of a can, not going to be as good for you. It's coming out of a can and it ends up having like the syrupy stuff in it. That's obviously not good for you, right? But prunes, plums, raspberries, you know, strawberries, tomatoes, tomato juice, again, all of those things end up being good things that are fruits, but you want to try to, maybe with the exception of tomatoes, you want to try to limit to maybe one to two fruits a day, right? You don't want to be loading up on, you know, be like, oh, well, I can have it. So I'm going to just load up on blueberries or whatever. Cause again, they do have, uh, you know, some calories to it. Um, Non-starchy vegetables, again, asparagus, avocado, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, celery, you know, there's a whole bunch of different stuff that's out there. You know, nuts and olive oils from a low glycemic diet standpoint, um, again, almonds, peanuts, pecans, um, 
you end up having uh, sunflower seeds and um, olive, you know, olive walnuts. Again, there's different things that, that are available and through there. Again, there's differences between the way that you would look at it from an anti-inflammatory versus glycemic index. But notice I'm not talking about, you know, sunflower seeds maybe, but for the most part, we're not talking about a lot of different types of seeds, you know, like, you know, sesame seeds and all that other kind of stuff. And then there's a bunch of other things that can be there, you know, so like there are certain dairies, fish, you know, like meat, uh, eggs, that kind of stuff are things that people can have that are going to be more on the lower uh, glycemic index, right? So again, skim milk, almond milk, uh, low fat cheese, yogurt, um, leaner types of red meats, those kind of thing, right? A lot of different stuff is going to be in there. There are possibilities of um, people getting uh, get, getting better there. Right. When it comes to supplements, uh, there's a whole host of things. And these are pictures of this right here is a picture of the supplements that we carry here in the office. Um, there's a bunch of different types. Like I prefer the now version because they end up having um, kind of quality control issues with them, um, as in they actually do a good job making sure that you get what you're paying for. Uh, the standard process stuff that you see there, that's stuff that you can't get in a regular store and you would have to get from a, a healthcare provider. But um, basically, like, this is my list that I'm going to just kind of say, and then I'll, I'll, I'll say something else about it here. So when it comes to supplements, there's certain things that you can take that can be good for you. So vitamin D is probably one of the most important things for you to take because most people are deficient in vitamin D. You know, if you are spending a lot of time out in the sun and that kind of stuff, then maybe it'll be a little bit higher, but that's something that can easily be checked with a blood test. You have omega-3 fatty acids, like things like EPA and DHA are extremely important. Magnesium is another fantastic um, supplement. Uh, whole quality, like uh, quality whole food multivitamins are things that I prefer as a multivitamin. Probiotics can be helpful. Um, a uh, antioxidant called coenzyme Q10 or CoQ10. Um, and then obviously, like we had mentioned previously, ginger and turmeric are going to be two things that are there. And those can be things that you use as a supplement or you can use that as a food spice. And then there's another thing that is called a uh, proteolytic enzyme. So what I'll tell you on this one is that um, if you look on the YouTube channel that I have, um, there is a couple of different things about supplements and vitamin D and other kinds of things like that. So as to uh, why those are the best supplements, it talks a little bit more about that. Okay. So I'll direct you there as opposed to um, talking at length here, because it would end up being a little redundant. Okay. Um, so Different things though, when it comes to vitamin D, these are some of the, the issues of like the benefits that vitamin D has. It does help you control blood sugar. It helps with concentration, learning, memory. It's protective against cancer. There are some cool pictures where you can see like where, um, you know, certain types of cancers, if you look at them, how they are, you know, if you are north of Atlanta, for a lot of these different cancers, your likelihood of getting the cancer ends up going up. And one of the things that reasons why it would go up would end up being because people don't get as much sunlight. You know, they don't spend as much time outside. And if you're not getting the time outside, obviously skin cancer wouldn't be one of those. Like you still have to protect yourself, but there's ways that you can do that in order to make sure that you um, are staying that you're not being silly when it comes to risking skin cancer, but you're still getting a dose of vitamin D in order to help yourself um, keep strong bones and keep healthy, right? So vitamin D though, most people don't realize it, but the vitamin D is not just a vitamin, it is a hormone, right? And it is actually, that's the way that it works in the body. It activates itself in the sun and it's a really, really good thing. But there's a couple of things with that. So the next one is uh, omega-3s. So omega-3 fatty acids are going to be one of the major kind of things that's associated with decreasing um, inflammation in the system. So again, promotes uh, heart health and bone health. It can help the brain's function. This is when you talk about people taking uh, the prenatal vitamins, Prenatal vitamins always have a 
um, omega-3 component to them. Usually they have one capsule that's a, um, a omega-3 capsule basically, which can be fish oil. It can be a couple of different things, but you want it to be omega-3. Um, but it has a bunch of different properties to it that is good for decreasing inflammation, right? There are things that are pro-inflammatory and there are things that are anti-inflammatory and omega-3 is one of the major ones that is anti-inflammatory, okay? So the next thing is to talk about movement. Movement is one of the things that is a critical step in reducing inflammation. Um, and again, the idea is, is that exercise, moving, again, there's all kinds of different variations that you can do with this. Uh, but the general idea is that you want to try to participate in, you know, 30 to 45 minutes of aerobic exercise and or, you know, 10 to 25 minutes of weight or resistance training multiple times a week, let's say four to five times per week, right? This is a good thing that's there. Again, movement is medicine. If you're moving the joints, then that's going to be something that helps to kind of like lube them up and make them so that they work a little bit better. Obviously, working on strength and all that other kind of stuff. There's multiple different things that are associated with, um, with movement that is beneficial. Now, obviously, you can go to the extreme because I have some patients who take things to the nth degree and when somebody is beating themselves up whether or not they're trying to do um the iron man or if they're uh you know again the iron man is something that will beat people up or ultra marathons where they're running 100 miles or people that are going to do something like the dopey challenge by running a 5k a 10k a half marathon and then a marathon in four days down in like Disney, you know, that, that those are the kind of things that happen that people will beat themselves up. So sometimes you got to kind of pull it back a little bit, but these are the kind of things that are there. So something like jumping rope can be something that is actually not super horrible for like your knees and other kinds of stuff, but you can learn to jump rope or you can kettlebell swing or different kind of stuff like that. You know, you got to, go easy on it. You can't go crazy on it at the beginning because you can get injuries if you do things and you just go nuts with it. But you know, you, you want to try to work your way into things or maybe get a guide. Having a personal trainer isn't a bad thing. I'm not necessarily uh, saying that everybody needs to work out with a personal trainer every time that they work out. But what I will say is that many people, um, Many people can use a personal trainer in order to help kind of program what it is that they're going to do, and then they can work out on their own. Or if you're doing exercises like deadlifts or squats or different kind of things like that, making sure that you're doing it the right way is important to make sure that you don't get injured. Lots of people go through and they just, you know, have seen other people do it or they watch people in the gym do it and they don't necessarily know how to do what they're doing and then they can hurt themselves so you know there is a little bit to be said about that but that is something to uh to keep in mind but again movement is a huge part of making sure that you stay healthy again brain health you know body health all of that other kind of stuff and the next one would be stress obviously stress is going to be something that if somebody has too much stress that can cause problems so Again, stress is going to help signal the body that there is a hormonal response that, that you have that's going on and you start a fight or flight response. And again, stress is normal. Like you're supposed to have some degree of stress. Like if you don't have stress, then again, it's not, it's not challenging the system, right? So you're supposed to do something to challenge, like think about it this way. Like when is the last time that you challenged yourself? Again, physically, mentally, any of that other kind of stuff. You're supposed to stress yourself. The problem is, is that people typically do it too much, right? Is that if you're pushing that fight or flight button all the time, you can end up causing problems. It's supposed to serve as a protective mechanism to alert us from harm. We're supposed to be, you know, like I, I always talk about like, you know, if you're walking out to your car and you see a tiger, right? First, you're going to be like, why is there a tiger out in the parking lot? But you're going to get freaked out by it. You should get freaked out. You should run back into the building or run to your car or do whatever. That's something that you should get. But a lot of times people get too much stress and they have too much stuff that's going on, panic attacks and other kinds of things. So again, the chronic levels of stress, you know, that's problematic. 
chronic stress can cause stress-related hormones to be higher than what they should. It can cause stress-related hormones to burn out and cause issues with adrenal insufficiency. And adrenal insufficiency can end up causing thyroid issues or it can cause like sex hormone issues or other kinds of stuff. So somebody could end up having um, issues with uh, female sex hormones, but it could be because there is too much stress in their system and their body is stealing the progesterone that they're making. So they don't have a good balance between estrogen and progesterone. That's something that happens and it happens on a regular basis. So, you know, again, there's a lot of stuff that goes on with that. The idea is, is that you have to try to control the stress as much as you can. So again, there's so many different types of ways to manage stress. And again, I'm not going to sit there and say that everything is easy and that you, know, you can just do it no problem. But it is one of those kind of things where like you have to work on those different methods. Um, so again, and some of this stuff can end up being physical exercise. Like if you're doing yoga, yoga is going to be a stress method. For the number, the number of patients that I have that are runners, that the way that they manage stress is through exercise is like astronomical. I would say that it's probably like 75% of the runners, you know, at least, you know, because they manage stress by going and running. Some people do it by working out and lifting weights, right? But other ways that you can do it would be like, yoga, like I said, meditation, and you can do yoga as a moving meditation. Tai Chi is also a fantastic kind of a thing, but people can do meditation. You can use an app, something like 10%, uh, like there, there's an app called 10%. I believe it's like 10% better is what it's supposed to be. And that's an app that you can use. There's another one called Waking Up, which is a fantastic app. And you can use those apps in order to kind of like guide your meditation so that you're listening to somebody and that you don't have to feel bad like when you don't pay attention to what it is that you're supposed to and you think about what you need to get done for work when you're trying to meditate so you can do it with help with an app you can do it with you know by yourself you know there, there's a bunch of different things that's there you can do gratitude journaling you can practice deep breathing you can do you know walking there's so many different things that you can do when it comes to managing stress the issue is is that it is a muscle just like anything else. You have to work it. You have to make it stronger. And the only way that you can make it stronger is by doing things in order to try to decrease your stress. You know, if you do meditation once, if you can go 20 seconds without having a thought in your head, then you're amazing at it because that is hard to do, right? You know, to actually like push the thoughts out of your head and just concentrate on the flame or to concentrate on your breath or any of those other things is difficult. But the more that you work at it, the better off that you can do. But again, it is a, it is a muscle. You need to work at it in order to get better at doing it. Right. So it's like, you know, practice and practice, practice. Right. Another thing that's an important thing ends up being sleep when it comes to dealing with inflammation. Again, getting restful sleep every night is gonna be essential in combating inflammation. We end up, uh, when we sleep, we end up having issues with our body ends up helping to kind of restore itself, right? It heals, it restores itself. The average adult needs, you know, on average about seven to nine hours of sleep. Um, and again, if you're not getting enough, you're not getting enough. And then it's kind of hard to actually like get, um, it is hard to repay that sleep debt that people can have. So if you're waking up tired or you feel sluggish during the day, there's a big possibility that you need more sleep. And one of the ways that you can do that is um, creating a bedtime routine. When it comes to creating a bedtime routine, there are so many different things that you can do in order to help that routine and um, make things consistent, right? So if you're having difficulty getting to sleep or staying asleep, you want to try to develop a nighttime routine in order to help to signal your brain that it's time to rest. Again, you want to avoid eating or drinking caffeine in the hours before bedtime. Some people can do it a little bit later than others. Um, you know, some people can't do it after 3 p.m., right? So it depends on you. Um, participate in calming activities like going for a walk, meditation, stretching. You want to try to turn off electronics at least an hour before you go to sleep or at the very least start using the the nighttime kind of stuff that has that red shift for the app because the blue light has the tendency to kind of um keep you up right 
take a warm bath, a journal, those kind of things. Having things that you do that ends up being part of your routine ends up being a big deal. Um, you know, again, you try to keep the room clutter free, try to keep the room a little bit cooler. Um, and then the other stuff is, is that you don't really want to be doing non-sleep activities as much in the place where you try to sleep, right? So what I mean by that is, is that you're going to have poor sleep if you have a TV in the room, you know, in your bedroom. Um, if you're doing homework in the bedroom, you're going to end up having a harder time falling to sleep in the room because it's not the only thing that you do in there. So people have the tendency to do other stuff that they would normally do in the bedroom um, while they're trying to fall asleep. And that ends up being problematic. So those are some of the stuff. Uh, another thing ends up being hormone levels. Uh, when it comes to uh, hormone levels, this can be something that obviously you can get your doctor to help test you on. Uh, there are different types of hormone imbalances that are possible. Um, most of the time there are blood tests or even uh, saliva tests that you can do that, uh, that in some cases saliva tests are actually better in order to figure out what type of hormones might be off and how to correct imbalances. That's typically going to be something that you might need a little bit of help with getting better, but you can see like an, an easy example of this would end up being insulin resistance, right? Skipped it. Um, it would be insulin resistance, right? If if you start here and you end up having something that's a super high carb diet, uh, fast food, a lot of processed stuff, you end up having, and you do that on a regular basis, you end up getting high glucose in your blood. If you end up getting high glucose in your blood, your body is constantly making or needing insulin in order to stuff the glucose into your cells because your body is basically going to take insulin and it uses the insulin in order to shove the glucose in your cells. When it does so, you typically have a exaggerated response, and then you end up getting all of the sugar out of your blood and into your cells. So you end up having, uh, when, when somebody ends up having insulin resistance, you end up having a, a situation where it's doing it over and over and over again. If you keep getting that high demand for insulin over and over and over again, your body will basically say that it's going to kind of ignore the insulin. And eventually you end up getting a down regulation of the insulin receptors and they become resistant. Guess what? Exercise is one of the things that primes insulin receptors in order to actually do what it is that they're supposed to do. Right. So there's a bunch of different stuff. So when somebody is insulin resistant, you end up having cells that are starving. Your glucose levels are too high. Your insulin levels are too high. And then you end up having hunger and cravings, which can cause not only other health problems that we had talked about again, but it makes you crave to have another high carb diet, right? Or a high carb meal or something like that. And then it ends up being this nasty cycle that just keeps going over and over and over again. And then your glucose resistance keeps going up. And then as that keeps going up, then it, it gets worse and worse and worse, right? So again, there's multiple different things that you can do uh, again, but this is when people talk about metabolic syndrome or syndrome X or other kinds of things. That's what they're talking about with insulin resistance. Okay. So that is basically uh, the whole thing about inflammation there. Again, I know that that is a lot of information. Um, basically the idea is, is that there's multiple different things that you can do in order to help promote a healthy lifestyle. Um, again, foods that you're eating, foods that you're avoiding, um, you know, things that you're doing as lifestyle changes, whether or not it's exercise or stress um, management and that kind of stuff. Those are all things that you can do in order to help yourself out. So um, I'll say thank you for your time. Thanks for joining us. Obviously, chronic inflammation has become more prevalent. And it, like I said, it's linked to a number of different diseases. So inflammation it is needed for wound healing it is needed for multiple different things but chronic inflammation is something that can wreak havoc so um like i said thanks for your time um if there are questions we can go through questions but um otherwise uh that's about it uh when it comes to what are my feelings on celebrex and stuff like that when it comes to the different types of medications, uh, basically the easiest answer for me to say is that it's out of my scope. Um, so it's not something that um, 
I am typically going to be using or treating people with uh, different things like that. But, um, you know, because Celebrex, since it's prescription and that kind of stuff, that, that, that ends up being a little bit problematic. The issue when it comes to that is, and any of the non-steroid anti-inflammatories is that the non-steroid, so Celebrex is basically for inflammation, right? It's to decrease the amount of um, issues that, that somebody has with pain and, and that kind of stuff. And it's basically in the same category as Aleve or naproxen or ibuprofen, that kind of stuff. It is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Um, it can help with arthritis and it can help with, um, you know, osteoarthritis, inflammation, swelling, stiffness, that kind of stuff. But every single NSAID, when it's taken over a long period of time, has the tendency to decrease the amount of or of healing that your body can have in response to injuries. So for basically when it comes down to it, if you take it on a regular basis, you will lead to less cartilage over time, which can cause problems obviously with joints. Okay. So that is basically the, the, the main thing that I would say when it comes to uh, Celebrex and other issues with that. Um, you know, that being said, I'm not going to sit there and tell somebody not to take a uh, medication that was prescribed by their doctor. But on the other hand, I don't think that people should be taking something like that long term if they haven't already tried to get uh, treatment for it. So whether or not it's from a chiropractor or a physical therapist or working on some of these other issues when it comes to the chronic inflammation, that would be something that would be something that I would rather have somebody work on. Okay.